Hello, everyone. Welcome to Build's Character. Today, I am joined by Lauren Urban, our, our community manager. We also have James Hake, our lead writer and the writer of many a D&D book. And we are extremely excited for Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. If you haven't pre-ordered that yet, you can do so right now. If you uh, check out chat, we have friendly mods standing by <laughs> with the link so that you may purchase this very exciting book. Um, there is one thing that creates some anxiety in me about Tasha's Cauldron of Everything is that I want to play all the things all the time. I have what they would call uh, issues when it comes to sticking to a subclass. I am a nightmare scenario type You say person. that like Tasha's is the new thing. This has been a thing for you for a while. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think Tasha's just uh, makes this a thing for everybody. Tasha's is enabling you, Todd. Yes, <laughs> All exactly. Of us, right? Tasha, <laughs> Tasha, Tasha's enables me because the crest is always greener. But but we have all these new feats. We have all these new uh, subclasses, and we've seen the table of contents for Tasha's. So we know some about what is in the book. So this is kind of a nice moment to, right before the book comes out on t Tuesday, to talk about like what if you have existing characters that you desperately would love to convert them to one of these subclasses, to maybe involve one of these feats. Uh, what do you do narratively? Like, do you, do, you, do you as a dungeon master allow a player to change their subclass or even class? Like, are there narrative reasons that maintain the cohesive structure of, uh, of the, what you're trying to tell together in terms of shared storytelling that would allow you maybe to include some of these new subclasses that are all super, super cool. Well, so yeah, go ahead, Lauren. Before we get into that nitty gritty of some of those story hooks and some of those options, I think that first question that you just asked is a really relevant one about as a player and as a DM, do you allow characters in existing campaigns to switch? Uh, do you allow them to change their character sheet? Do you allow them to, you know, do any of these from little things like, oh, I'd just like to add this feat instead of something else that I took all the way up to, I want to completely revamp my character. Yeah. And I'm going to say as someone who has been on both sides of that, yes, do it. Absolutely. Um, from a, D a DM's perspective, I actually already did this with multiple characters. I have a long running campaign in where my barbarian player wanted to switch when um, the, the some of the new barbarian subclasses came out in one of the last books and was super excited about it from UA and uh, was really in, interested in playing this version of the barbarian and had found that the um, they were the, the berserker from before and the, they had just not been finding as much joy in that subclass as this new subclass that was coming out. And making the switch was actually relatively easy, especially if everybody in the group understands that you're doing this because it's going to help this person have more fun. Right. Like you will make the, the narrative work or you'll just ignore that you need a narrative if the focus is what's going to help this player have more fun in this moment. So I, I would just put out there right away if if you are a DM and you are worried about any of your players coming to you with Tasha's and saying, you know, I've been playing this character for a while, but I'm looking at this subclass right here, uh, or I'm looking at this feat, or I'm looking at this, absolutely, if they are really that excited about it, make it work. It'll, it will work out. Everybody will want to help your, your fellow player have fun. And if moving to a different class, subclass, any of it is going to make that happen in your campaign, absolutely do it. Yeah, I think yeah. it's it's worth noting as we delve into the uh, role playing and storytelling aspects of changing a subclass uh, to one that you might find in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything that uh, that book does contain some mechanical options uh, for it. Now we can't we can't talk too in depth about what goes on in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything till it comes out, but we've all seen the uh, the IGN article that previews the table of contents of Tasha's. We know what subclasses are going to be in there. But if you look closely at it, uh, you'll see that on that table of contents, it lists that changing your subclass uh, is a topic that's discussed within the book. So uh, there will be some uh, direct mechanical support for the stuff we're gonna be talking about here today. That's very exciting. I, I actually did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
so good on me for organizing this little <laughs> session Todd, of... you've just got a little sixth sense sense about it you know <laughs> i don't know it's weird it's like i'm magic <laughs> or it's like I think about D&D way too much <laughs> or just enough. Well, and, and also we've been hearing about the the UA that has been coming out for months and months and months and months and months and months and months. And, months. and then slowly as um, more and more of the subclasses have been officially announced, it's been a lot of the UA that people have been currently playing. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think there's a lot of people who, if they're not currently playing a character that's a unearthed arcana character that's going to be switching to one of these now official characters is a lot of people who saw something yeah. that come out in ua and go oh if that ever makes it into a book mm -hmm. well now's the time i think a lot of people gears are already turning is there anything that like sticks out for all of you where you you could see being kind of tempted by the dark side or perhaps tempted by the light side to, <laughs> to switch your subclass um, having seen some of these new fresh options. I mean, there's a feat in there that um, <laughs> there's a, U, well, there's a UA feat that I believe is going to be in this book that I already have on one of my characters. Um, but as far as subclasses go, I mean, there's, there's been a bunch of them. Um, I, one of them, one of the rogue subclasses is one that I'm, I was playing as a character in uh, with the UA version. So being able to update that, you know that that if I was still playing that character would be a a very minor transition. All right, I'm still being the same character and class and subclass, but now some of the way some of my powers have changed. And whether you want to just, I think there's going to be some groups that are just going to say, ah, well, this is just how this works now. It's fine. We're not going <laughs> right, to worry right, about right, it. Right. Yeah, but it could be interesting depending on how your abilities change to go into the the mechanics of that and the role playing of that why is it that i now i can do the same thing but it happens in a different way or i i lost this ability but i gained this other one you know i think that's a a really interesting a uh, narrative hook for both the player and the dm if they want to go down that exploration i think a really good example of this uh, now that I'm looking at it right now, uh, under Sorcerer, we have the Aberrant Mind, which has previously described, you know, you, you maybe you have a Mind Flare tadpole in your brain. Um, and that becomes quite fun, especially with given the context of Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, I could see just about any character class or subclass getting converted to the Aberrant Mind because some part of your brain has to make space for this tadpole maybe and that's your origin and this tadpole doesn't you know gestate completely inside of your brain it alters you and suddenly you could have been a i think a fighter a cleric maybe you were, you were a wizard maybe you were a different type of sorcerer but as you kind of became suffused with this aberrant magic coming off of this tadpole maybe certain abilities that you had certain magic that you had faded away but then in in place of that you now have these very kind of um psychic like abilities now and i think that's that's an easy one and a creepy one narratively i think to, another uh to, to bring to fruition <laughs> yeah i i think another very fun one uh is the phantom road which uh, we can assume is similar to the revived road from unearthed arcana right with a lot of undead and spectrally themed abilities uh just imagine a rogue character, maybe an assassin or a thief that uh, botches a job in the middle of a campaign and suddenly finds himself on a, the business end of a poison dagger. They're killed and maybe they are afflicted with maybe this poison has certain supernatural properties that prevent them from being revived uh, by use of standard clerical means. And this is the sort of thing that if your DM just does to you out of hand, you maybe uh, yeah. <laughs> might say, well, that's kind of a jerk move DM. But yeah. the perfect sort of thing to set up by planning with your DM in advance uh, and telling them, I'm tired of uh, playing with thief abilities. I would really love these uh, spooky, ghostly phantom ones. So how about you kill me? Huh? Come on, come on, hit me. <laughs> I would I would even say if you're gonna go down that road, if you're gonna go down the um the heroic sacrificial road, talk to everybody in the campaign. Mm. Talk to your players and your DM. Uh, definitely talk to your DM so that it is not a surprise to to 
and, and your DM can help set up that moment. But, and it's going to sound contrary because everyone's like, well, I want to be able to have this, this surprising moment. But here's the mm. thing. D&D is shared storytelling. If you tell your players, your other players in the campaign where you want to go, even if it is, hey, listen, I'm ready for, to retire this character. Can you help me go out with a bang? Yeah. Then your pl because if they don't know there's going to be this awkward moment where your character is dying and you're okay with it and the dm is trying to plan it and your friends are sacrificing themselves right. to save this character that you're trying to have a heroic mm. end to so <laughs> yeah, that's have fair. that discussion with your friends it it is i promise you it will not make that moment any less epic it will still have the emotional weight that you want but it will be, um, it will literally be a shared story moment. You might not know exactly how it's going to happen, but you all know what the last page of the story is. How do we get there together in the most epic way possible? So I highly recommend if you do want to go down the road of, I'm done with this character, I'm just starting a new one, but in the same campaign, have, buy pizza for your friends and talk with everybody. <laughs> and And have that moment because it will be more fun when it happens. It won't be this awkwardness. I, I almost feel like we've seen this moment play out on Critical Role once where everyone wanted to dive into how we save this character, right? And and, and Matt actually had to like step in. I'm like, we're going to wait till next week. <laughs> like he's like, but we, we we have enough time. And it's like, nope, we're not solving this right now. <laughs> yeah. Just wait, stay tuned. <laughs> like, Sometimes give us a moment. A little bit of executive oversight can make the story run just a little bit smoother. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, that is a good point because you're putting your cleric through undue stress. Um, <laughs> yes, Lauren, absolutely. you wouldn't know anything about that. I would know absolutely nothing about that. No, um, I, I, I do like this almost like a Christmas Carol like thing that could happen to the Phantom Rogue. Right, you're, you're a regular assassin, and the ghosts of the people that you've killed are catching up to you. Ever played right? Metal Gear Solid Three? Yeah, <laughs> <This is> where, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe someone out there will get what I'm talking about. But, but uh, I, yeah, I like the creepiness of that. I think it's pretty easy to switch for clerics to different subclasses. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's kind of baked into paladins as well. Yeah. I, 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 I think the, oh, sorry, go on, Lauren. I was just gonna say, before we move on to a different class, I did want to quickly address a question that we just got in the chat because this is gonna be incredibly relevant to our D&D Beyond listeners, especially. Um, Kex wanted to know, is there a way to update a character from archived to the updated version? Mm -hmm. And this is specifically dealing with if you have unearthed arcana in your one of your characters, whether it's um, a subclass or a feat or a spell, anything that has been archived, which is what D&D Beyond does when we've got uh, unearthed arcana content that is now essentially retired wizards of the coast says we're, we're done with this go ahead and um retire this you can't use that with new characters but we don't remove that from old characters so in this case um they're talking about having an orc character which the old version of the orc got retired got archived and now they've got this new version mm -hmm. if you have a character that currently has that on it right now we don't remove that we don't alter your character sheet without trying to warn you. Um, and so what happens is you just see that that says archived. You can very easily get the more updated version. Um, if you just go and edit your character sheet, you will have the option to pick the new version, you know, in this case, the new version of the orc. If you are currently using Unearthed Arcana, uh, for one of these subclasses that's coming out in Tasha's and Tasha's releases, and now you want to update this character to the the fully released version, you just go into the character editor and repick whatever it is you want to pick, and it will the character sheet will will change and update and adapt, and you'll be able to make all your new decisions from there, and it'll save the stuff you've already done. Uh, my only caution is once you remove unearthed Arcana that's been archived from your character sheet, you can't put it back. So if you're playing with stuff, if you're unsure, if you're thinking about one of these subclasses, but you're not sure, make a copy of that character and do it on a copy of the character. Uh, but yes, anything that has been archived, if you want to change it, you just go into the character sheet, uh, char character builder, and you can update any of that. Fantastic. That's Sorry, what... I had to become community manager for a moment so that we could go back to. I think uh, I think, I think we found DMs. a clip. <laughs> no, that's that's good information that everyone needs. That, that was a that was a that was a solid knowledge dump. Well, and it's <laughs> going to be a big deal next week because, as as is 
pretty obvious, and we've already talked about this in, in socials, anyone who has um, Unearthed Arcana from the last year, essentially, all of that is being archived. So we have a post on the forums that you can go check out with all of the details, with you know what we do, and we've been warning people, so you can definitely get that checked out. But uh, I personally am excited about getting the updated versions of a lot of these characters because they've gone through play testing. So that's always yeah. good to know. Anyway, uh, we're going to talk about clerics and paladins and... Yeah, I, I, I want to lay out some kind of broad categories as we're talking about this because there are a number of classes. The, the subclasses kind of work differently uh, in terms of flavor for the 12, well, 13 now different classes of D&D. Uh, there are some classes whose abilities fall into a, a like trained category. If you're a fighter, mm -hmm. then you have gained your subclass abilities largely through your own personal training. And there are, are, are classes whose features fall into a granted, a gifted category. Uh, if you're a warlock or a cleric, most of your abilities are granted to you by some larger power. And there's also characters who fall into a sort of social category. If you're a paladin, you have an oath that you've sworn. If you're a druid, you have a circle you belong to. If you're a monk, you have a monastery who's given you the training you need. And, you know, there's overlap between all of these. It's not really rigid pillars. But uh, if we were talking about changing what abilities you have, thinking about the classes in these different ways can be useful. Uh, changing your subclass as a cleric is as easy as renouncing your old, as easy as renouncing your old faith, choosing a different God. And, you know, perhaps there will be uh, some punishment, some divine retribution that you must face down, but the, the power switch may be almost instantaneous. Yeah. For uh, a fighter, if you're changing from a battle master to a rune knight, you know, uh, like, like Yoda says, you must unlearn what you have learned before you can gain a new skill set. So what, what does that look like? Do you need to find a training master? Training montage. Yeah. Do you need a training, training montage? montage. Yeah. Class the training montage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sorry, that, I had that, to. That, that feels like at least downtime activity. Yes. You know, if not a full-on adventure where you are trying to find literally giant rooms. Right. I mean, well, like in older editions of D&D, &D, if a paladin ever fell from grace, they may have to go on a quest to you know, redeem themselves and regain their abilities. Mm. That seems like a perfect sort of lead in to a paladin who is renouncing the oath of devotion and taking up the uh, oath of heroism. I, I love the or, sorry, idea. Sorry, Oath of Glory now. Oath, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love yeah. the idea of a training montage as that middle ground of, hey, I want to be able to switch. And we want to be able to explain this in role playing, but I don't necessarily want to go on the year long quest. So yeah. how do we, how, <laughs> and then and then that's that uh, negotiation with your DM. It's like, all right, then uh, let's wait until we're at a moment where you can have uh, two weeks of downtime. And when that <laughs> happens, we'll make the switch. And yeah. that, I think that's a great middle ground for those those kind of campaigns. Mm -hmm. There's and there's a lot of little weird fun things I've I've enjoyed in in video games and pop culture like Knights of the Old Republic, um, famously takes a character that is extremely powerful. You might call them a Sith sorcerer of some kind, and uh, they te tear all the magic out of them. Basically, <laughs> they tear the Force out of them, or at least their ability to use it. And the whole game is them relearning how to use these powers. But what if you were a sorcerer? Um, and then that magic was taken from you. Or perhaps you were a warlock and you had a patron and the patron kind of kicked you to the curb and, and then tore the magic out of you again. It, I could see you going on this fighter montage of, okay, I don't have these abilities anymore. So I need to like, just get in shape, <laughs> you know, this think of, I, I, I could definitely see you becoming like a battle master, right? You know, um, but like Rune Knight would definitely appeal to someone who was a caster who fi finds that maybe their connection to the weave isn't what it once was. So they're, they're finding a way to supplement that. Uh, or maybe you're switching your character and the, the backstory and your, um, you know, I'm specifically looking at the wildfire druid for a very right. specific reason. Now it's not going to happen with my character, but if you are say a, a cleric, a light cleric specifically right. and you're looking at that wildfire druid is like you know that's got all the fun fire stuff that i really want to do uh you don't have to be a cleric or a paladin to be a devout of a god 
You right. do not have to give up that relationship with a deity if you don't want to, just because you're thinking about not being a character that is um, that has the devoutness in a way baked into their class. And certainly um, I could see both uh, clerics, especially light clerics, looking at that wildfire druid mm -hmm. and saying, I'm willing to give up turn undead for that. I'm willing to give up, you know, channel divinities for that because it's got so much of the fire and the healing in that class. And then you get some other fun stuff. So that might be a situation where um, I'm now going to be a druid who prays to this specific God. And this is how I get my powers. And this is how I uh, manifest them. And it can be that kind of positive relationship and where you're just the the role playing kind of works out you just now have a new power set so i i think there's a lot of those kind of correlations especially if you're looking to make the big jump the i i want to change my entire class right and i think that makes a lot of sense you know we're basically talking about orkara eldrex which lauren plays uh who who worships this giant primordial phoenix and i think that makes an incredible amount of sense because it's a a it's a primordial like that that's in that that to me is a very easy shift mentally that yeah. you, you have moved from one like god to a primordial and doing so primordials are basically a manifestation of nature in a very extreme way so suddenly becoming a, a druid uh circle of, the, of wildfire makes a ton of sense it, it was probably narratively one of the easiest transitions i could see and um while specifically Orkira would not because there's too much about being a cleric that she gravitates to in different circumstances. Absolutely. I think light clerics, depending on your circumstance, might be looking at that that druid. Uh, speaking of druids, I have to interrupt for the sake of chat. James, uh, would you like to introduce the familiar on the back of your chair? Everybody wants to know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is Marzipan. She's one of my two cats that me and Hannah have. She's very sweet. And she's a very scaredy cat, so I'm trying not to uh, make any <laughs> sudden movements because she will bolt. <laughs> All right, chat. You, you, you now have the information that you wanted, so everybody stay calm. <laughs> nobody, nobody startle the kitty. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I figured I had a couple people asking, and so I figured I'd just ask you. But yeah, Aww, if you, Marzi, you're famous. Yeah, you go. Well, I've said in multiple uh, Twitch streams that what makes a good Twitch stream is technical difficulties and/or a cat. So <laughs> it's true. There we it's go. Or both. Mm -hmm. uh, Often are both. there? How do we? We've got two rangers that we know are going to be in Tasha's. One of them is the Fey Wanderer, and another is the Swarm Keeper. I can kind of imagine the Swarm Keeper in my brain in this kind of weird, um, you know, the, the earlier Batman films uh, with Michael Keaton and <laughs> with when, when Catwoman like falls out of a skyscraper and all the cats kind of swarm around her. I could see that kind of scenario. Um, but like the Fey Wanderer, how would you like transition someone into being the Fey Wanderer? Would, this would one seems like a pretty straightforward one. The Fey Wanderer is a ranger who is uh, kind of infused with the power of the Fey Wild. So uh, I, I consider rangers to be one of those kind of training first classes, right. much like a fighter. But this is one that does meld those distinctions quite strongly. If you have a bit of adventure that takes you to the Feywild, or you, you know, you say to your DM, hey, DM, I'd like to change. Can we go to the Feywild for a hot sec? You know, yeah. what happens if your, if your ranger is suddenly, you know, struck through the chest by a bolt of, you know, just sort of like ambient Fey magic, or if they uh, make make an almost warlock-like deal with a pixie who uh, who flutters by. Then suddenly their old skills kind of melt away and are replaced in their mind by a more gifted sort of power, uh, that of the plane itself. Um, but that's not the only way to do it. I, I'm sure that everyone has their own uh, unique and personal way of how they would adapt to the Fey Wanderer. You know, maybe, maybe they found a book of fey lore or something they've started studying that otherworldly place oh i like that like they as they're reading the book you know they physically change themselves 
Yeah. Uh, also, you know, time doesn't work the same way in the Feywild. So uh -huh. I was thinking exactly that when you're like, go to the Feywild for a hot second. I'm like, or several years. Yeah. Or several years. <laughs> like, or both, man, depending. That's your training montage. That, yeah, that's a it's time really dilation involved. training montage. That's actually a really, really good idea. <laughs> yeah, we've got this downtime for two weeks and the rest of the party, it's two weeks. And when the ranger comes back, it's been five years. And they've got some gray streaks suddenly, in their hair now. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> that's pretty things. great. That's pretty fantastic, actually. <laughs> I mean, that, that's very sort of Celtic myth. That's very sort of British Isles, sort of you've wandered into the fairy ring and suddenly everything has changed for you. Yeah, I, I, I kind of adore that adjustment. Um, mm -hmm. I, and that's that's so easy to explain. Um, Swarm Keeper, I, I, I just imagine horrifying stuff. <laughs> you know, uh, maybe it, it comes to mind like the Morbius trailer, right? Like where... What if you want to be a swarm keeper ranger with bats and like you 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 literally are in a bat cave and you've just been bitten so many times um you form this weird relationship or maybe you've <laughs> fallen into this cavern hit your head you're dying and somehow these bats bring you back to life you know there can be some weird narrative there I've um, wanted to reflavor the swarm keeper ranger and and just literally reflavor the the swarm as instead of being animals it would still work the same way except it's plants and then you've got poison ivy that's fantastic yeah that's I've, a good point well yeah. what if it's just like pollen like it, you're like the other version of the circle of spores druid in, in a way um or it, it like you said yeah it's seeds yeah it can um Man, I really do have Metal Gear Solid 3 on the mind. Um, <laughs> imagine you're a ranger who has formed a companion, uh, a companion bond with like a queen bee or some sort of like almost fae or demonic queen bee. Right? Uh, the, the hell wasps in mm, yeah. Avernus. Oh, you have, oh, <laughs> you've, you've got a, a queen hell wasp just sort of like strapped to your chest. And through that magical influence, suddenly you have command over over all of the stinging insects that spawn in the world. Yeah, that's a very fun adjustment. Like I feel like the ranger, like you said, it they are typically very training based, but both of these feel like a fairly easy and kind of great. Nar what I like is the potential for narrative change in your campaign right now. That is just weird, <laughs> like in a super fun way. I think monks a little more difficult. Um, I think way of mercy is like you're going to basically become a doctor mm. <laughs> like you've, think... you've decided to like learn how to be a surgeon or something your midlife crisis right so i've yeah. got to ask i find it interesting that you find monks more difficult but we just talked about like the fighter training montages yeah you don't see the monk going through a similar i'm changing my style and so i'm gonna go do the training montage thing i suppose so i feel like it makes a lot of sense to be like okay you know what i'm gonna put myself through monk medical school i'm gonna learn to be the way of mercy i can see that i, I feel like that's gonna take more time um oh. to suddenly be able to healer be a healer as a monk uh way of the astral self though you're right that makes a little bit more sense i could see that kind of jedi knight montage right um uh, where you, you are learning to project your true astral self mm. um, what I, that that what is I, that i mean monks are all training they all they are yeah. all perfection what i like about the way of mercy is it you know, a lot of these subclasses are here, be a monk, but have a little bit of healing, be a monk, but have a little bit of this. Um, it's a way without having to fully multi-class or go feats in order to get a little bit of the flavor that you might want from another class. Mm -hmm. And if you've got another member of the party who's that class, then maybe it's not a full on training montage. Maybe it is, we've hung out long enough. I've picked up some, some healing spells from you. Uh, you know, the, if the monk and the, the cleric are hanging out a lot together, maybe the, the, you know, one of them is picking up some tips and tricks from the other and has finally learned enough to be able to make that transition um, without having to go through the full on, I'm going to go off and study for a couple of years. And then you get that flavor. And then, and then it's a connection with somebody else in the party. If you can say, you know, I'm going to switch over to way of mercy. And it's because uh, we've spent the last three months together and you've taught me so much about triage and the body and healing and all of this that I, I now have these powers that's a really interesting connection with your fellow players at that point and maybe the training continues maybe now your your cleric starts learning how to punch things maybe I, other yeah. things happen 
That, I, I mean, critical role is a great example of that, right? When, when we're, I think from day one, that was kind of planned between, um, say, uh, Not the Brave mm, and mm-hmm. Widow Guest. The mm-hmm. fact that he's already a wizard, and as they leveled up, you know, choosing that subclass at third level as a rogue to be the, you know, this arcane trickster, because you've learned magic from the wizard over time is a really fun thing to do to work out with your party ahead of time. We've, and we're all also currently seeing this kind of with Travis Willingham um, with Ford, having spent time with Caduceus talking about the wild mother and gaining, gaining abilities as a paladin that are more nature oriented, certainly more ocean ocean oriented uh, mm-hmm. makes a lot of sense. So Characters training their friends is so much fun. And it really highlights the bonds, not just of friendship, but of like tactical teamwork that, that D&D can encourage. Uh, you know, as, as a game designer, I'm always thinking about how can we meld mechanics and narrative. And one of the best ways to do that is to kind of represent a growing of friendship is a growing of tactical interconnectedness. And this is a really, really potent way of doing that to show people gaining, uh, sharing abilities that they train each other in. I have to say, uh, as we're talking about sharing and caring, uh, the chat right now is giving away, uh, there's a, a giveaway going on to give away a copy of Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. And the, the term that they're using in chat, the, the word you put in is marzipan. So, Aww. Aww. so Aww. you now have a chance to win uh, what will be a pre-order copy of Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, thanks to the cat. You did it, Marzi. Uh, <laughs> I feel that from what I know of the, the, the barbarian path of wild magic, I would let anyone, I do not care what class they are, become a barbarian uh, path of uh, wild magic or wild soul. Um, simply because I like the hulkness of it that you have just been struck, like you said, like a beacon of fey wild energy or wild, a wild magic surge. And now you're just ripped for, I would let you change stats. I would let you change feats. <laughs> you're just like this ripped hulking mass <laughs> of radioactive you know, magic. <laughs> and you might have been this skinny little wizard. You might have been a different race. Like, <laughs> and I feel, is, I feel like that's the easiest one of all. Like, boom. <laughs> this is the opposite of the uh, friends training each other. This is the moment in where the wizard has cast fireball and, and has singed their party members one too many times. <laughs> and when the fireball recides, something is different about you now. <laughs> like oh whoops uh maybe maybe i shouldn't have done that so yeah i i love it i i i played the ua version of that class and it's ridiculous and fun and i can't wait to see the the changes because the ua version was amazing i played an aracocra uh, barbarian that was the wild soul and rolling on that table at the beginning of combat is exhilarating and terrifying it, it really does kind of bring to bear the, the stuff I liked the most about Wild Magic in 2nd Edition, actually. Um, and so, yeah, if I'm playing a Barbarian, there, there's two very tempting things here. Like, the Wild Magic, I feel like that just can happen to you. Like, there's just a gamma radiation burst, and ta-da! You're, you're now this big, hulking, uh, radioactive man. <laughs> but, like, Path of the Beast works pretty well, too. You know, you could have you could have played, I think, a number of classes. And if if you were bitten by lycanthrope, and for a time you spent be you know some time being a lycanthrope, and then so you got cured, but some of it just never left you. Mm-hmm. I think that's really a fun way to suddenly become a barbarian uh, path of the beast. I think you could uh, make a. I think it's a harder case to switch classes to barbarian. Um, path of the beast but i think it's i think i think it works like i think it takes a little bit more narrative time than boom right possibly or you know we did just get done with spooky season and there's a lot of people who just did a one shot if not a small little campaign in curse of strahd so maybe there are more people out there right now who are primed to have been bitten by werewolves than than normal so maybe maybe now's the perfect time uh but once again that that goes back to talking with your dm about this kind of thing because if you want to set up that kind of narrative hook 
they're going to be your partner in this. They're going to be the person that, all right, let's work out how we're going to make this happen. And then the DM makes it happen. And then it's fun and interesting and you just roll with it. Yeah. And, also, and... I think if you're switching to a barbarian, like like my player did, I think you're going to have a pretty strong opinion. Like people who play barbarians, that's that's such a focused class that has such focus for what they actually do that if you want to change your play style i i think players who are barbarians or players who are looking to switch to barbarians there's something really appealing that they will be willing to work and do whatever it is you need to do to get the character the character that they want so um i don't i i'm confident that dms and players will be able to make that work it, and it really is about that fun. I, I mean, I found the mm-hmm. uh, I, I I switched for all manner of reasons uh, to um, you know uh, my main character to War, Warlock Undead. That has been nothing but funny and weird, and has shaped that character because of the creepiness of like not blinking, uh, sleeping, or eating, you know, or breathing for that matter. And it has become just doubled down into this goth, you know, Gomez Adams kind of territory. Um, that has made that character way more fun for me and way more fresh. But warlocks are so easy um, to shift patrons, right? And mm-hmm. I lo- and we saw this with Chris Straub uh, on the C team. Um, Kathris Drow uh, having shifted, what, three or four times? <laughs> like, he's got enemies in some really big places. Like, he's yeah. two subclasses four times. Like, when when, four when times. you said easy. Yeah. <laughs> it's like easy in some ways <laughs> it's like leaving the mob it's um <laughs> you know you know what it makes it easy for the dm coming up with uh, more narrative ways to uh approach your character with uh certain enemies that you might now have in uh, very important places so that's yeah a, very that's easy. a great point we've talked so much about uh how how players can find ways to change their subclasses it might be worth considering what a dm can get out of a player mm-hmm. changing subclasses because uh one of the things that I think uh, every DM needs in their back pocket is the ability to uh, pick up the uh, the hooks that characters drop for them, not just players picking up the hooks a DM uh, casts in their direction. Because players, every single thing a player character does can, with uh, a little bit of DM ingenuity, be a story hook. Um, little things can butterfly affect their ways into massive campaign changes and uh, or just a single one shot or even a moment within a session. A, a warlock changing patrons is so seismic a shift that I uh, honestly as a player I'd be disappointed <laughs> if my <laughs> if my DM didn't make my life a living hell for at least a couple of sessions after it. Uh, face those consequences but like even if you're uh, doing kind of one of the the less uh, I- narratively impactful subclass changes, like let's say you're changing from a, uh, a purple dragon knight fighter to a PSI warrior, um, you've gained you've you've let go of your knightly training and you've learned some psychic abilities instead. Um, what would then happen? Uh, maybe your your brain is almost like a psychic beacon, right? The, the psionic waves that are emanating off of you have suddenly uh, attracted powers that normally would have ignored you. Mind flares are an obvious one. Avalanche. <laughs> Always. <laughs> These don't have to be evil Always. things. You're absolutely right. You're just, you're just being constantly followed by flumps. <laughs> I mean, flumps will well, burble out I'm... of the underdark and follow you like they're your, your new god. <laughs> I love this campaign. I want to create this character to play this campaign right now. Why am I not being followed? Why am I not a swarm keeper ranger of flumps? Get Alpha Stream on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> join me join me (laughs) yeah definitely like having i know as a dm in the middle of a campaign especially if it's a homebrew campaign having a a super easy narrative hook like i want to change my subclass Mm -hmm. that's a blessing whether Mm -hmm. whether you're making your player's life a your character's life hell or heaven or it's just some more interesting rp you know it can be as simple as you know that that same night that you were just talking about 
um, maybe it's not a world shattering event, but suddenly they're, they've shifted, you know, it's kind of like coming up to a friend that you haven't seen in a while and they've switched jobs. Mm. And so now they're, they're former coworkers, mm. they're former knights, you meet up with them and maybe they're happy for you or maybe they're confused or whatever, but there's definitely going to be that moment of like, Hey man, you changed. What, what happened? Well, why? What what brought this on? What you know? So having those introspective moments, even when it's a small change, can be a lot of fun. Yeah, especially when you're a druid changing circle circles, for example. Um, I, I've never I've never gotten a chance to explore that kind of uh, element in D and D. Like there are a bunch of other druids that you you communicate with and you you know. I've always been kind of a lone druid, but how they feel about you once you leave that circle could be very interesting intrigue um certainly warlocks I, I can just see like you know if you're the, you were a fey wild warlock and you've switched over to you know the kraken or the, what it's called the uh the the fathomless uh, i can see some red caps coming for you because that you know no one you know no one in the fey wild has your back anymore right you know, in older editions of DD, back when leveling up was kind of asymmetrical among classes and you had to do specific things to level up mm -hmm. the only way for a druid to uh advance become an arch druid was to kill <laughs> the yeah. arch druid of their circle and take their place was it yeah. also for monks as well didn't you have to find the monk that was just ahead of you in the yeah order? I, I don't and recall had, but that sounds there was there was exciting sounds, thing i believe yeah because i mean kind of like least, martial, actual martial arts you have to fight someone at your own yeah higher level yeah you had to yeah. at least defeat them in combat if not kill them so yeah earlier editions and, of D, &D <laughs> were brutal Jeez. and it, like it, you don't very afro samurai you know <laughs> <laughs> you know the, the the owner of the red headband like you, you don't necessarily have to go full uh you must kill the archer to take their place uh thing now but uh if you want to uh that kind of gives you a feel of how druid circles might be they're a little primal almost mm -hmm. um so it, it, when you're considering changing druid circles or if you're a dm if a player is considering changing druid circles uh think about what the politics of a circle is like how how these druids behave because i think that's something i rarely to never see going on in dnd &D campaigns because circles druid circles are always very abstract ideas but a, a circle is an organization it's a group of people who all want different things and who all have ways of viewing the world and these are not people who you know sit around in coffee houses talking about the news these are people who live in the primeval forest or you, you know deal with fire on a daily basis these people think differently than than the three of us do yeah yeah, I don't know. I, I think about fire think on a that... daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> now, like the bar is interesting <laughs> because you have a college. That implies, and I don't want to go back to college. <laughs> like that, that's it's bar is an interesting transition that I wouldn't. I would have a little heart. That seems like that is totally training. Um, although maybe, maybe you could let your players take three months, and maybe 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 you go to you take some summer classes. <laughs> As, as someone who went to real life bard college, I, I would like to say, uh, I mean, yeah, you, you can definitely do that. I, I will say, though, the the college of creation, mm. like we saw a bit of that. And I think when we're talking about some of these subclasses that were struck by a universal force, by the Feywild, by wild magic, being having the moment in where you are uh, awed by the universe in a way, especially in a D&D &D campaign that can include travel to other planes, that can mm. include far realm stuff, that can include gods and demons and, you know, planar travel. I think it's very, um, <laughs> once again, we saw this in Critical Role. I, I won't go into spoiler stuff, but one of the characters in there is having a, a kind of a weird existential crisis because of something that they saw in a vision that mm. gave them a view of the the universe at large in a way that they didn't understand. And while that was a more a horrifying moment, I could definitely see a bard being so enamored and and awed by the beauty of creation and the universe that 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 changes their perspective on how they perform 
perform, on how they interact with people, on how they use their their talents and their abilities to help and aid their friends. So I think College of Creation is is easily for the bard one of those in where if you want to, you just wake up one day changed. Mm -hmm. I can see that. Yeah, that's fantastic. I do like that. Um, I can see like a trickery domain cleric becoming a bard college college of eloquence because you just doubled down on your words become true you know that's the trick like that i could see that kind of weird subtle transition um i like the idea that this has jumped into my head of if you want to be a clockwork sorcerer what happens if you did die like and then the cleric revivified you and something went wrong maybe the, maybe you had bad diamonds maybe it was only a a diamond that was only worth two hundred and ninety nine dollars. You know, like <laughs> why, why you gotta keep calling me out like this, Todd? Come on, I'm just saying <laughs> something went wrong. Like one of those facets is wrong. So when they bring you back, when they use Revivify Raised Dead, they bring back a different version of you, and that version is the Clockwork Soul, and you, your mind now has seen the universe on this higher level, and you're not exactly the person that they knew. You're maybe another alter alternate reality version of the person that they brought back. I I love that idea and I have a different take on it as much as the cleric part of me is like, what do you mean it went wrong? Um, <laughs> there's a, <laughs> if you're a higher level character, when you get into things like Raised Dead and Resurrections, there is a very important line in those spells and where it talks about the spells only work if the target is willing to return. And so if you're looking at exactly what you described, except, you know, you take that, it's not that something went wrong. It's that maybe you weren't willing and now you've been offered something, or maybe you mm. were willing, but something got in the way and you made this, this deal while dead, or you were sought after, you know, maybe mechanists came to you while you were dead um, and, and said, Hey, I like what you've been doing and I'd like you to continue. And I will make sure that you are brought back appropriately if you, if you want to so um that moment is a that, that's a that can be a very life-changing moment it can be a traumatic moment and that idea of being willing to return means that character is is bringing with them something so that's i mean that's that's been such a creepy part of fiction too um to, that you bring something back it's interesting to think about the clockwork soul also in the maybe not all of you wants to go and all some of you does and so you don't have maybe the full spectrum of emotions anymore like you know you or you you are far more logical than you were like not all of you decides to like maybe you split you know can can a soul in D, &D split and then you have this clockwork soul version that is somewhat mechanical in nature um it's also like a potentially interesting way to like make that happen. Anything else stick out? Like, I feel like feats, a lot of the feats that we've seen that are likely in this book, it's, you can make a strong argument for grabbing these. Like you've been, you've been cooking, <laughs> you've been doing stuff. Yeah. A lot of these feats are super, uh, not to do a pun after that flavorful. Um, <laughs> they're, they're really fun. Yeah. Um, they, and they offer a lot more of those alternatives. Once again, if you are looking to get a, a bit of something else in your character, but you don't want to go full multi-class, you don't want to go full changing your subclass to something else. A lot of these feats that we've seen in, in UA offer that. Um, and so I, I, and what I like about them is they, they offer a little bit more variety than some of the feats that, that are just currently available, especially for still giving you at least a little bit of an ASI. Um, mm -hmm. I am enough of a, I'm not a min-maxer, but I'm someone who does want my, the one stat that I need to be good to be good. And so at low levels, it's hard for me to want to take feats because uh, I want to get that one stat up. But some of these feats, because they offer um, so much flavor and then also at least a, a bump of one, those are really nice. It's it's good to want to be good at what you do. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I agree. But you know, it's it's a it it can be an in, that's a whole other discussion about min maxing versus just being effective versus <laughs> right, blah right. blah blah. But like that's what's appealing for me about those feats is it allows me to to get a little bit of the crunch and a lot of the flavor. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, this yeah. is all food metaphors, isn't it? <laughs> it's all food metaphors, and there's a, yeah. there, there are a lot of other options for us to 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 delve into if we wanted to for subclasses. And you know, we know that there are group patrons in this, so you could be working for an organization as a group, and that's how you're getting this training in some of these regards. Like, what if your group patron was a circle of druids? You know. Uh, we haven't talked about there's one subclass we haven't talked about or at least one class that we haven't talked about their subclass and that's the wizard um because the the ua uh the scribe wizard is in there that's true and i think right to your point about being a a member of a society or having a group patron what is more classic than being part of a a, you know the watchful order of magis and protectors being a part of a a wizard school being a part of a an order of wizards and uh leaning into that by doing the order of scribes can Mm -hmm. be really fun and maybe you are a wizard who just really wants to get into more of the nitty-gritty of of the mechanics of your spell book and how how the (laughs) the study works be the nerd you always wanted to be it's interesting because that one in particular almost feels like a prestige class in that I, that feels like the natural, it's the most wizardy wizard mm. that I've ever encountered. <laughs> so like, maybe this I can is what see you almost anyone to, becoming that eventually. Maybe when you're the archmage, this is what you switch to. Hey, once you reach level 15, you get to be this. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it has that kind of, uh, it has that feel about it. So I, I, I like that very much. I think, yeah, it's changing wizard. Uh, wizard schools because it's a school maybe you go back to school (laughs) but there are a lot of ways i think narratively to make that happen we haven't talked about artificers artificers are included Mm. included in this um i think that's a relatively easy lift you just spend time working on your armor or your weapons you spend time building a steel defender of some kind you you can make the case of like where i mean look at tony stark you know, he, this this is a guy who makes missiles and all this other stuff for a living. You know, off you know what weaponry for the military, and then he's like, oh, I'm going to build a suit now, though. <laughs> like that takes some time, not a lot for him, <laughs> but still takes a little bit of time. So I like the idea of maybe you're an alchemist and you decide, you know what, I'm really good at making combustibles. I'm not so much into like healing people. (laughs) I keep trying to make a healing potion, but it keeps exploding on me. So maybe I should just lean into the- Just lean into that. (laughs) Maybe the nitroglycerin isn't the kind of thing I want to put in the health potion. And so bombs, there we go. Yeah. What if if I just make a cannon that shoots potions? (laughs) I'm using it as, you know, these chemicals as jet fuel. I think that makes perfect sense. I think that, and that right there is one of the most easy transi- transitions I could think of. I think becoming an armorer is a little bit more, more, more of a sidewalk, you know, uh, uh, to, to, to explain why you've made power armor for yourself. Maybe you're a battlesmith who's like, you know what? I have this steel defender. I'm kind of jealous. I think I'm going to wear my steel defender. Actually, that's literally what happened in a campaign I'm running. Uh, one of oh. <laughs> uh, one of my uh, players went from being a battlesmith artificer to being the unearthed arcana armor, and uh, she literally uh, opened up her old <laughs> her old steel defender and turned into armor. Uh, it, it's a great idea. Yeah, just just also- get the robot. Just get the robot, <laughs> the steel yeah. defender, and <laughs> wear it. I also like the idea of being one of these other uh, subclasses and wanting to become the armor because, uh, you know, I just get knocked around in battles all the time and I'm kind of sick of it. And I'm, yeah. I've been one, you know, I've been making all the stuff to help all of you, but I'm watching the barbarian and I really want to just get in there myself and, you know, whatever the urge is for protection and uh, wanting to maybe do a little bit more frontline damage. That's, that's the, the impetus for why any kind of <laughs> artifice would be like, and now exoskeleton. I, I like it because the armorer is very proth- prosthesis, uh, I say it terribly wrong, uh, oriented in a way. So, you know, like, what if you were a god and now you have no magic for whatever reason? And you're like, I'm going to build a suit of armor to replicate all these things I used to have? <laughs> like, this is a very that, specific reference you're coming up with. It is a very specific reference, but. Very specific reference might be. Yeah, like, I like the idea of like, maybe you were a former fighter and you had an injury 
and you're trying to supplement the, you know your your inability now to like be as strong physically and you make armor to make up for that it that's a nice story as well i i like that because you could literally be the fighter who's switching to being an artificer and not only do you have the armor to supplement you know and 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 help you but now you can talk about well why am i suddenly so good at being on the front line it's not just that i've got this armor that is helping protect and, and supplement this this injury that i had but i was a fighter i used to know how to do these maneuvers mm -hmm. i know how to fight in battle i'm just recovering from an injury Injury, or this is just not something that I can physically do anymore without this aid, but I still have that knowledge. And being, you know, we've talked a lot about taking your current character and transforming into this new version, but I, I like the idea of not losing what you gained, you know? Yeah, I do too. Yeah. Going on and it, it, even if it's only in role playing, even if it's only this is what I used to be. And so, you know, because I, I find that kind of backstory stuff also compelling as a DM, because then that's another thing that I can um, help you and you can help me with if we're in a situation where like, hey, my backstory talked about how I used to be. A, a bard and I used to be able to do this stuff but now I'm an artificer but yeah I went to bard college and I studied these instruments and I know this even if I can't play anymore yeah. um me then giving you some you know advantage on a performance check or uh you know giving you some knowledge just to help with the story because it works with this former version of the character that you had you know just because you've transformed doesn't mean you lose that experience I think that makes a lot of sense for stat changes as well, because, mm. you know, you could be the world's greatest chess player, but if you're not practicing, that's going to atrophy. So uh, if you have sustained an injury in the game and your strength goes down to eight, you're forced to like sit there and go to study the books and no, figure out how to build armor that will like kind of allow you to do the same thing. And who knows better than you, like what a right hook should be. You just have to train your armor to do it for you. In a, in a sense and you can kind of like describe it in that set in, in that way um I, i'm al always down for a reasonable explanation as to a stat change um I, I think i think we've seen a lot of shows about that and like not necessarily stat changes but we do see that montage of the hero trying to heal up to repair mm -hmm. themselves whether it's like mm -hmm. you know the dark knight after after fighting bane you know that kind of scenario but becoming something very different different because of this very big experience possibly with the nemesis of the entire campaign is also a great starting point for changing a subclass and 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 swerving in a different direction that that's all our time anything else I, can, i'm gonna say one other thing real quick i 100 percent agree that i think a lot of these things are amazing role-playing moments and there's there are things that your dm can uh get into and coming up with reasons and explanations and out you know all of this it's also okay if you and your team if you and your your friends and your dm just want to remake the character and it's fine everybody's just going to hand wave it away it's 100 percent if that's yeah. going to bring you joy if you just want to change your subclass and everyone is just if you are the kind of party that's just going to kick down doors and fight monsters and as long as you're having fun we don't care how you switched your subclass and it's more important that you just get on in there and switch from being a barbarian to a sorcerer just do it it's okay d d is not a rigid video game. You can, you know, you get to do what you want. I mean, that's yeah. that's the fun of all of this. It's shared storytelling. Yeah. I mean, uh, even in a rigid video game, right? If you're playing Gauntlet, you can change from Valkyrie to Warrior yeah, in between exactly. stages. I mean, yeah, yeah. just like. <laughs> wow, Gauntlet re reference. Yeah. Uh, Very apt. Well, I like it. Very good. Well, uh, pre you can pre-order Tasha's Cauldron of Everything right now on D&D Beyond. Uh, there, there'll, there'll be a link in chat and then a link in this video description. Uh, it's coming on Tuesday, so lots of excited, co exciting content and a lot of possibility for story. Thank you so much, James Hake, our lead writer and the writer of many a D and D book. We got Lauren Irvin here, who is the community manager at D and D Beyond, and uh, just the the knower the knower of all things. Uh, thank you so much <laughs> for watching. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Pre-order Tasha's Cauldron of Everything on D&D Beyond and unlock exclusive pre-order rewards, including digital dice.